good morning, church family. Let's stand together and get ready to praise our awesome God as we celebrate the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and his birth this week. Let's join our voices with the angels who announced his birth to the shepherds and in heavenly chorus proclaim, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. Amen. Hallelujah. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the sky, with angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born. In Bethlehem, hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Yes. Christ by highest heaven adore, Christ the everlasting Lord, light and life to all. With healing in his wings, mild he lays his glory by. Born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give him second birth. Hark the herald angels sing.
thank you for the love you poured out to us. Oh, it never fades. All oh, the gift you sent 2,000 years ago, still given today. Pouring out your love, Lord. Pouring out your grace. Hallelujah. Nothing can separate. Even if I ran away, your love never fails. I know I still make mistakes, but you have new mercies for me every day. Your love never fails. You stay the same. Your love never changes It may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me for my good You made all things work together for my good You made all things work together for my good All things Oh, you made all things work together for my You know, we serve a great God. And, you know, no matter what we go through, whether it's sickness, just any difficulty in life, just know that God is always with you. He loves you and he will never fail you. Amen. Well, you may be seated. Good morning and welcome, RLC families and guests. 
We're so very happy that all of you have joined us today. We hope you and your families are healthy and doing well. Good morning, everybody online. Um, I hope you enjoy the, the service. Thank you for tuning in, and Merry Christmas. A big happy to our Lori Colebrenner. She must have sneaked out of here because she was here the first service. <laughs> but yes, if you happen to see Lori, wish her a happy birthday. She's awesome. And we hope you have a great day. Oh, there she is. <laughs> Don't be trying to sneak out, Lori. <laughs> Amen. So for those who don't know me, my name is Dave Parker Jr. I am the head usher here. I serve with Eric Furbeck and many other wonderful people. We love to serve you. Thank you. If you're uh, here for the very first time, we are glad that you're here to join us. Um, when you came in, you should have received, received a welcome brochure. Um, you can fill that out completely. Also, if you have a prayer request, there's also a part in there that you can fill out. And what you want to do is... Fill it out completely, and at the end of service, you could either give it to one of us ushers, you could take it to one of the um, uh, brown cylinders there at the exits and drop it off there, or you could take it to our welcome center, and we have a free gift we'd like to give you. That's uh, the room with the big window off of the, to the right. So we just want to say thank you for coming. The Word for You Today devotionals are now available for December through February for all RLC members. Please pick up your complimentary copy in the church foyer. There are many copies available for a small donation in our Welcome Center, and they really make good Christmas gifts. So if you want to bless somebody, you know, grab two or three. If you participated in the Operation Christmas Child and you are tracking your boxes, be sure to put a pin on the map on the counter in the foyer so that you can find out where your boxes landed. That's a pretty cool map. I was checking it out earlier. The RLC Christmas Eve service will be one service, and it will be held at 6.30 this Saturday. So please pray about what friends or family you might want to invite. Again, it's too important to you know, not give someone Jesus if they want it. Please be reminded that all of our announcements can be found on the church app, the Twitter, and our Facebook pages. We always want to say thank you for your continued giving. I mean, we definitely can give... You know, every day, all day, doesn't matter the time or the season. Giving is always a good thing. Um, if you want to give, you can mail it in. You could give at the giving stations located at our exits. You can give online on the website, or you can give on our church app. Now, I want to share an offering reflection that I think you guys will understand. See, I love this time of year. Um, you get to share it with family and friends. and It just means so much, especially with Jesus' birth. But Christmas means so much more to me now because over the years I've realized that it's not about getting a gift. It's about receiving the gift of Jesus, right? See, when I was 16 years old, I had a good friend share Jesus with me. He cared enough about me to tell me about Jesus and this, that I could gain, you know, eternal life. So ever since I made that decision, my life has been changed for the better. My beautiful wife that I'll be married to 16 years this Thursday is one of them. <laughs> my two awesome kids who are just great people. My two beautiful granddaughters. My brothers and my sister. My two great parents. My devoted church family. And our outstanding leadership. So I consider myself extremely blessed. But none of this is possible if God doesn't have his way in my life. None of it. John 3.16 in the New King James Version says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now, if God can give me eternal life with all the things that I've done that you, I don't want to share tonight, <laughs> surely I can give him my tithe, my time, and my talents. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for this season. We thank you for these gifts. We ask that we use these gifts unselfishly. We ask that you use the time, the tithe, and the talents, and allow them to reach far above we may ask or think. Lord, you've done so much for us. This is just one way we could give back to you. 
I thank you, Lord, that everyone who needs those gifts will, be, will allow them to be received. And it will change their life as it changed our life. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, we want to dismiss all the, any kids who might be in the service. If you are six weeks through sixth grade, you're going to go to the Res Kids on the right. If you are seventh grade through twelfth grade, you're going to go to Quest. And all of us can stand and greet one another. Good morning. Thank you for joining us here. For those of you that are online, thank you for uh, connecting and joining us today. You know, it's fun to watch you guys greet each other. Um, we need to realize, just as Dave was saying, that the people around us, God has given us His gifts. And God only gives the best gifts. And uh, we need to give God thanks for that and treasure those gifts and, and uh, do the best to be a gift back to those around us. Amen? Um, this morning, before we go to the Word, I just want to share with you uh, what you've been up to. <laughs> what do you mean? You, you had me followed? No, I want you to know what God has used you for uh, through just one of the uh, missions organizations that we support on a regular basis. It's uh, World Compassion, Jason Law. So watch this video. Resurrection Life Church, Pastor Jeff, we want to say thank you from your family at World Compassion for your generosity this year. You have changed the lives of thousands of people in nations hostile or restricted to the gospel. In Ukraine, you are helping empower the local church there to provide food, transportation, and shelter for families displaced by war. Then over in Iran, the church is growing like crazy. It's estimated that almost 50 million people are turning away from Islam in search for truth. This year alone, we've helped reach over 40,000 people through Bible distribution and one-on-one -on -one evangelism. That's over a quarter of a million people so far that we have reached in that nation. In addition, this year, over 600 people have gone through our discipleship study program. Then over in Iraq, over 12,000 people have received care through our mobile medical clinic. In one village, 32 families have surrendered their life to the Lord. 320 ladies have gone through our skills training program, learning cosmetology or sewing. 60 of these women have given their lives to Christ this year. 
here as well. Then over in Asia, in the country of China, where the government has implemented a new law prohibiting religious content being shared online. And despite that, we have over 5,300 students currently going through our discipleship, leadership, and church planning program in the context of their local churches. And as I film this today, we're gearing up to start an additional thousand students by the end of this year to finish strong. We're doing the exact same type of training in the country of Myanmar that's 89% Buddhist with over a thousand students studying right now. Then over in Cuba, we're helping several pastors to build out their local church buildings to hold the growing number of people coming to their churches. This is all of a result of your generosity. So thank you. Your giving's not only making a difference right where you are, but in some of the most restricted environments around the world today. Let's keep changing the world together. We love you all. You guys have been busy, <laughs> but you have. You have, have impacted people that you'll, you'll never see this side of heaven. But I'm sure once in heaven, they're going to come up and let you know they appreciated all your giving. And that's what we're here to do. We're here to give. We're here to love God and love people, uh, give to God our lives, and, and give our lives for others. Uh, it's not just that organization. I was talking to a man that we support with uh, SOS uh, Adventures Ministries uh, there in Africa. He was telling me that there are so many hundreds of thousands of people they're seeing in their big crusades that are Muslim turned to Christ. Uh, over 500,000 in the last six months. This is amazing. And we don't see this, we don't hear this, but know that God is doing what he said he'd do. In the last days, he said there would be a harvest that he, of souls he would bring in, and he is doing that very thing. And just because you don't see it and I don't see it doesn't mean it's not happening. As a matter of fact, the thing that we need to hold fast is God has said it, he will do it, and we will see it when he does it. But before, before we ever see it, we've got to believe it. And that is true about your family and my family too, your friends and my friends, that we believe that God is working, drawing them, loving them uh, to him, even when we don't see it. God, God cares about every person. He's not left anybody out. There's nobody that's not seen by God and not loved by God. And so God is, is reaching out to our family members and friends. And so we need to be continuing to thank God for the salvation of our family members and our friends. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Um, I, was, I was really blessed. Debbie and I were away, and uh, uh, we were down in New York City at a memorial service for one of her cousins. But I will tell you, I listened and watched the, uh, the message from Sunday, and like every Sunday, God is so good. Uh, through Mark Colebrenner, he shared a great message and I am so grateful. God makes sure no matter what's going on that we here will be fed. Amen? But give thanks to God for the gift of Mark and all those that make every service possible. So, I'm not ready. Seven days away, I am not ready. I've had a year to prepare. A year to plan, and it's jammed up in the last week. I'm sure you don't do that. <laughs> but, you know, millions of people are going to celebrate Christmas. But the question I have is, why? Why are they celebrating Christmas? What's the reason? That's right. That, that, that catchy phrase, Jesus is the reason for the season. Now, we know that. But, you know, a lot of people celebrate Christmas, and it's not because of Jesus. It's because of a lot of other things that are good things, but they're not the best thing. And uh, when, we, when we look at Christmas, we do understand, as Christians, it's about Jesus. And it is. It's about his birth. But there's something that is very impacting and very important for us to recognize about his birth, because it's not just about a baby coming into the world. There was something that God was doing through this time. And today we're going to look at this because we can miss, easily miss, the reason for Christmas. That it is about Jesus, but it's about something even more important uh, that he came to do and has for us to do. 
Uh, we, can, we can get caught up in food, and there's a lot of preparation, a lot of good food that goes on, and presents, and family gathering together. But God has a bigger impact to be had through Christmas, and today we're going to look at this. Uh, but before we do, if you just bow your heads, we're going to pray because it's important, always important, that in everything that you hear uh, said here, that you would recognize what God is speaking to you. Because our God is a personal God. He wants to have a personal relationship with each one of us, involved and invested in imparting to our lives what we can't get anywhere else. And so the Bible tells us that his sheep hear his voice. We're aware when God is, is impressing on us something that we need to uh, incorporate in our lives or adjust in our lives. So Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being present with us. You have said where two or more are gathered, you are there in their midst. So, Father, we thank you for your presence. But, Father, we need more than just your presence. We need your participation. We need you. We need you to guide us and govern us and guard us. Reveal to us, Father, uh, the truths that we need to trust in and be confident in to live and overcoming abundant life. But Father, also help us become aware of what your word is encouraging us to adjust in, how to realign our lives and to uh, cause your kingdom to truly be at hand and your glory to be revealed in us and through us. And so, Father, thank you. Thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of speaking to your church uh, Father, use me today for your glory and for the building up of your church. We thank you for all of this in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. So this morning, Dave shared a scripture with you, one of the best-known scriptures, but it really has a lot to do with Christmas. God so loved the world that he what? Gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe on him would not perish but have everlasting life. And, and that's why we know Jesus came. God so loved. You know, this Christmas, we're going to be giving presents out. Presents, presents, presents. Going to all sorts of people. And we can give without loving. We do it. We give presents to people that we don't really love. But maybe we feel an obligation. Or, or that present is an opportunity. And, and it's not out of love, but it's something that we've, we've just chosen to give. But you cannot love without giving. When we love, we will give, because that's the very nature of God. He is love, and he does give. And so this Christmas, we need to realize that there is a lot of giving going on. But God gave something very unique, very special, very costly, and that was his son, so that no one would perish, but everyone would have everlasting life. He loved and he gave. God was reaching out when he gave Jesus. And Jesus was reaching out when he gave himself. You know, when, when Jesus came into the earth, he left the perfect place. He left heaven and came to live with us, which is an amazing thing, and it was quite a sacrifice. But... In God loving the world and giving his son, God was reaching out, reaching out for a connection, to reconnect man with him. Because back in the garden, when Adam and Eve sinned, that sin broke the connection with God. And there was a division between God and man. And Jesus was coming into a world that was filled with sin and division, and, and difficulties, and danger. And yet, he was willing to do it, make that sacrifice, because his father wanted to reconnect with mankind. What an amazing gift. What an amazing sacrifice. And so Christmas is really... At the very heart of it is loving connection and reconnection that God made possible when Jesus came into the earth. Until that point, sin had separated man from God. And at that point, 
when God gave his only begotten son, he made a way for man to connect with God and experience the abundant life God always intended man to have. And we're going to look at the Christmas story and see this in the Christmas story. Now, in the Gospels, uh, Mark is the only one that doesn't have anything about the Christmas story. Matthew has a little bit about Joseph and the angel that came to him in a dream and told him about what had happened with Mary, that she had, had been uh, received a child from God, uh, and she had not been unfaithful to him, and he needed to marry her. And they were to call his name Jesus. And then Luke is the, the gospel that we, we read most times, the Christmas story, because it has the most information and most, most detail. But where we're going to start this morning is in the Gospel of John. So we're going to go to John chapter 1, uh, verse 1. And it's very short, but there's some really important things in here about the birth of Jesus. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We're talking about Jesus. And then it says in verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the birth of Jesus. When Jesus came to the earth and was born of Mary, he had a human mother and God as his father. This was the joining of deity, the divine part of God, and humanity. And it's called the hypostatic union. Now, that's a big theological term, and I just read it, so I thought I'd share it with you. Aren't you impressed? Uh, but the hypostatic union is where God and man came together. And, and in Jesus, God, the fullness of God existed and the fullness of man existed. Now, you may say, well, can you explain that? No, I can't. But it did. God does things we can't explain. Because with God, all things are possible. And so Jesus was fully man and fully God. But one of the things that Jesus did was he set aside all his privileges and all his power as God to live as a human being so he could show us how to live the life that God had intended when we reconnected with God. And so we, we have this opportunity to see him, but it says he became flesh and dwelt among us. The, the word dwelt is actually, it means to, to pitch a tent. When Jesus came, he didn't just come and say, hey, shape up, I'm coming back. He came and lived among us. But he didn't build a mansion or a castle or anything. He came in very humble, humble beginnings and walked in a very humble way. And in that, God was reaching out to connect to man so that man could reach out and connect to God and that man could again reach out and connect to other people and connect to God. Now, the message translation here is, uh, is really good. Uh, it says this, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. You know, I like that because imagine, imagine what Jesus did. Here is Jesus, the Son of God. God the Father says, this is our plan we need you to go down, live in human form, live a sinless life, die on the cross to pay the price for the sin, and, and make a way for people to connect again with me, with us. He's leaving perfection, heaven. No sorrow, no tears, no pain, no sickness, no prejudice, no anger, none of the stuff we're experiencing here. And he sees earth for what it is, just saturated with sin. Darkness, death, destruction, danger. And he comes and lives among us. What an incredible sacrifice. What Love to be willing to leave everything perfect that we're all looking forward to going to and say, I'm going down and I am going to give myself to my father, to his work and to people 
for their salvation. I mean, God was very determined to reach out and connect, reconnect with us. And, and who were we? We're made in the image of God, but God doesn't show through all the time to each other. And that's where if you would look, if you would take this in the natural, if we were to say, you know what, we're living in the best place, the perfect place, and, and all of a sudden you were invited to go to the worst place, the most dangerous place, the place with the most damage because you were to connect with those people, I think we all would have a hesitation. But there was no hesitation in Jesus. He came. And he willingly sacrificed and was made flesh and dwelled among us. He pitched a tent. He didn't pitch something spectacular or sensational, or dazzling, or dramatic. Because, you know, our God is supernatural. Our God is extraordinary. But he doesn't always do these sensational things. We as, we as human beings, because we have to catch somebody's attention, we try and do something sensational, or spectacular, or dramatic, or dazzling. God does supernatural. I remember many years ago, listening to Dennis Sandberg uh, share a message and Dennis made a statement that has never left me. He said, you know, when God wants to do something with, with and through people, he puts his super on our natural. And he does. God, when you read the Bible, you see God connecting with and using ordinary people. For the most part, absolutely ordinary people that other people would overlook, would discount, God, the extraordinary God, uses ordinary people, and when they combine, when they connect, when they trust and yield to the will of God, they do extraordinary supernatural things. And God wants to do extraordinary and supernatural things in your life and through your life. And that's what we see in Christmas, the extraordinary the supernatural being done because God connected. God reached out to connect. And then we know that Mary reached out and connected to God and Joseph reached out and connected to God. And then we see a number of people and we're going to see that today. But in John chapter 10, 1, verse 10, it says this. Jesus showed up. He showed up and it says he was in the world and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. The world did not know him. Now, the uh, New Living Translation says, he came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. They didn't recognize he was God. You know, I told you that Debbie and I were at a memorial service for her cousin, and uh, it, was, it was a great honor to him, and and celebration of his life. Uh, family got together, and, and one of uh, Deb's cousins uh, I had the opportunity to talk with, and, and I didn't realize that he was uh, employed by a security company as a bodyguard for very high-profile people uh, in the business world, in the entertainment world, in the sports world. And he was sharing one story with me that I realized it, it had a lot to do with what we're talking about today because there was a couple that had made a lot of movies who were very well known and pursued because people wanted to know about their lives. And they were about to have a baby and they contacted the, the uh, security company and, and said, you know, what do, what do we do? And they told them, gave them a plan. And uh, the baby was born and... The reason why they wanted to know was because you know and I know that many times there is a bounty put out when there is a child of a celebrity that comes into the world. They, they put a, a, a over $100,000 bounty for the first picture of the new child. I'm sure they did that for yours too. <laughs> My parents didn't have that happen. But, but it, it, was, it was crazy. Because 
uh, Deb's cousin told me we were, we were trying to manage this because they wanted their privacy. And so one day the, the wife, the mom, uh, took the nanny and the baby that were in the back seat out for an appointment they had to go to. And as they were driving down the road, a car pulled right out in front of them and they didn't hit that car, but they had to stop. And at that very moment, all these photographers just surrounded the car and started taking pictures. Fortunately, the nanny had been trained and told, if anything like this happens, put a cloth over the child and they won't get their pictures, which happened and they were left to go on their way. And this happened a number of times. And... Uh, they, they were saying, you know, what, how, how do we get out of this? And Deb's cousin said, here's what you do. You choose who you want to give exclusive rights to taking the picture of your child with the understanding that they split the bounty that's out there for the first picture, and you give your part to charity. What a great plan. But this was for a child of somebody who made movies. Something wrong with that picture? Because what, what, who was there to celebrate the birth of the Son of God? Nobody. They didn't recognize him. And many times we don't recognize God. Working in our lives or through our lives because God doesn't do the spectacular the sensational, the dazzling, or the dramatic. He does supernatural. He does extraordinary. And sometimes we're looking for something else when God's very clearly at work in our lives and through our lives. And so they didn't recognize him. Now, we're going to go to Luke, which is the main resource that we have for the Christmas story. And and. Luke chapter 1, Dr. Luke is beginning to write about Elizabeth and Zechariah and their baby to be born, which was John the Baptist. And sandwiched in there, it talks a little bit about Mary and what she was going through because Mary was Elizabeth's cousin. And so we're going to pick it up. We're not going to read this whole thing. We don't have time, but we're going to read some of it. And in verse 26 and 27, it says, Now... In the sixth month, and this is of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Gal Galilee named Nazareth, a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. So we get some of the big players in, in this event, Mary and Joseph. Now, what do you know about Mary's family? Yeah, she had a cousin. That's about it. We don't know a whole lot about her. Now, there's some other information that's there, but it's not extensive because Mary, to everybody's indication, was ordinary. Ordinary teenager who was going to connect with an extraordinary God to see extraordinary things done. I want you to know this morning that God uses ordinary people. God uses people like you and me. God, God's word tells us he takes the weak and the foolish and the base things. Not, not the celebrities, not the stars, not the, the ones that we would pick. God picks the ones that nobody else would pick. Look at the disciples. And he does what he does when people connect and let God have his way. And in this moment, the angel Gabriel, one of the three archangels, is sent to Mary to begin to reveal to her what God, God is reaching out to connect with Mary, to reveal to Mary what he wants to do through her life that will change the world. Oh, but that's Mary. I want you to know God is reaching out to every one of us every day to work in our lives to change the world. You heard thousands upon thousands of people this morning. Their lives have been changed because you have been involved in a way that seemed like 
you know, I don't think that much about the money I put into the offering. Your money in the offering goes to things like that. You are changing the world. But God wants us to recognize that we can have a greater awareness of the change that he's, he's using us for, just like with Mary. He can reveal things that God has for us to do. And at this time at Christmas, Christmas is about connection. But the thing that we're going to see is that connection is God to us, us to God, and then how does that translate to other people? Because it doesn't end with us to God. So Mary, Mary finds out this information, and uh, in verse 30 and 31, it says, The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor. That word favor is the same word as grace, which is what we're saved by, the empowering presence of God to be what God has for us to be and do what God has for us to do. You have found grace with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Now, is this an extraordinary thing? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I read this and I've got to tell you, when I understood that a virgin had a child, that didn't compute. But God does the impossible. God does the supernatural. God is able to do exceptional things in ordinary situations if we'll allow him to connect with us and we'll connect with him. Do you know the, the God that brought a virgin, a child, is the same God that is reaching out to you. Our God is the miracle-working God, and he's not changed. And he never will. As a matter of fact, in the times that we live in right now, the Bible talks about the miracles that God is going to do through the church. Astounding, amazing, exceptional miracles. And so he told her not to be afraid, but are you kidding? Why wouldn't she be afraid? She's talking to an archangel. She's being told things that are impossible. And yet, Mary, ordinary Mary, who is being reached out to by God to connect, finds herself reaching back to God. You know, when God reaches out to us, we need to reach back. It, it's, it's a relationship. In any relationship, you can, you can have somebody that wants to be your friend, but if you ignore them, the relationship won't be what it was intended to be. And that's where we have a part in this. Once God reaches out to us, we need to be reaching back. We need to be inviting God and allowing God to do what he and only he can do in our lives and through our lives that will impact the world we live in. And many times, the closest ones to us when God has his way, our lives change dramatically. And we are no longer who we were, but we're becoming who God has for us to become, which is extraordinary because we're supposed to be imitators of God. In verse 35, in 34 and 35, after the angel tells her this, and, and she, he tells her, you know, you're supposed to call his name Jesus. That was very out of the ordinary because usually you were named by somebody else that was in the family somewhere. But these were what God was, was asking of her. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. God, again, reaching out. He says, my spirit, my spirit is going to come upon you. My power is going to overshadow you. 
Do you know it's no different than what God has for you and me as believers? He's put his spirit in us. And he has his power available to us to do these extraordinary things through ordinary lives because God has reached out to connect with us and we've reached back and connected with him. See, Christmas is about connection. It's about connecting to God. God connected to us. And then we're going to see how it goes beyond that. He'll be called the Son of God. You know, that was one of the names of Jesus. He was the Son of God. But Jesus, 79 times in the Gospels, calls himself. How many of you know if he calls himself that, it's an important thing to note. He calls himself the Son of Man. So he is the Son of God, but he is the Son of Man. And it, again, shows us that connection of the divine and the human, of the ordinary and the extraordinary, and what God can do through that. What God can do through your life and my life when the extraordinary and the ordinary connect and work together and produce something that is beyond belief beyond imagination. Is it spectacular? Is it sensational? Well, yeah, if it was known. But God didn't always make things known to everybody. You know, when Jesus did miracles, many times Jesus would say, don't tell anybody. Very different from us today. Miracle happens in our midst. Tell everybody. You know, if a miracle happened today, we'd be saying, tell everybody so they can come back and experience. Jesus was like, don't tell anybody. Now, I don't completely understand that. But Jesus didn't want people following because of something other than love, other than trust. Because we can be so focused on his hands that we don't look at his face. What we can get instead of the life that comes from him. Then in verse 37 and 38, the angel answers and says, for with God, nothing is impossible. If you don't get anything else here today, I want you to get that God is reaching out to you every day and wanting to connect. He has connected, but we need to keep that connection vital and we need to reach back and realize that what God wants to do, anything is possible. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what your family's facing. I don't know what you're going through, but God does. And if we will recognize God reaching towards us to connect and we reach back to God to connect with him, God can do the things that you and everybody else have thought are impossible, but with him, it is possible. It goes on to say in verse 38, Mary said, behold, and this is for all, Ordinary Mary to say this extraordinary thing shows her reaching back to connect with God. Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your what? Word. And the angel departed from her. She's heard all these things from one of the archangels, God reaching out to her, delivering God's plan, God's word to her, and Mary, everybody's overlooked Mary, but Mary is, is processing this. And Mary does what we all need to do. I am the maidservant of the Lord. The maidservant was the lowest servant in a household, the most common, ordinary servant. She's saying, I'm nothing special, but I'm reaching back to you for you to do whatever extraordinary thing you want to do through my life. Because God wants to do the extraordinary through your life. Whether you realize it or not, you're already a world changer just by virtue of what you heard today. But God wants you to be a world changer right where you are too. And she said, let it be done to me according to your what? Word. 
according to your word. She didn't say, well, you know, when I start feeling things, then I'll agree to this. She trusted God. This is her reaching back in faith and trust to God to say, have your way. Just like Jesus was willing to have the Father have his way in coming to earth. Now Mary is willing to let God have his way through her life, even though she didn't understand all that was being told to her. Do you think Mary understood what was going to happen? No, absolutely not. Many times that's what, what is really the, the hinge on what we, whether we give ourselves and connect with God or not. I don't understand, God. You're going to have to make it clear to me. I want to I help you out, okay? It's okay if I help you today. If God explained everything that he was about to do and what he was doing in the universe, our little brains would pop, okay? And we don't make that demand on anything else. If you drove a car here today, if you had that same philosophy dealing with your car, or even with your own body, I have to know how it works before I can, can agree to it. How many of you know how your car works? Seriously. I don't. But I get in my car every day and I start it up. I get in it expecting it to start. And then I drive it having no idea how all that stuff works. But on God, I, you need to explain it to me. Really? Really? If anybody shouldn't need to explain themselves, it's God. Because he has a proven track record. God has never, ever failed. Everything. What does that leave out? Nothing. Everything God does is good. Because the Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from him. He doesn't need to explain. We need to believe. And I, w I want you to understand why. Because God gave us a break. If we needed to understand before we believed, none of us would believe. He gave us the ability and the opportunity to believe before we understand it. Because we can choose to believe anything. Because we do. We believe all sorts of things that aren't true because we choose to. We believe some things that are true because we choose to. It is that simple. It is a choice. Will you just choose to believe? Because that's really what faith is. Faith is believing before you see it because you trust the one who told you. And God is to be trusted in all things. In all things. Then we, we move on uh, to Luke chapter 2. And this is where the meat of what we usually read on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day about the birth of Jesus. And, and it, the, the setup is that a ruler, a Roman ruler, was going to take a census so that they could accurately tax more people. All right? How many of you like taxes? I know. Dumb question. Obvious question. Nobody likes taxes. How many of you know taxes aren't always bad? <laughs> I don't want to say yes. <laughs> How many of you know God can use taxes? Wait, you'll see. It says, so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph went up to Galilee out of the city of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David, which is called what? Anybody know what Bethlehem means? See, this is important. Bethlehem means house of bread. Now, why is that important? Isn't it appropriate that in the house of bread, the bread of life would be born? See, God, God doesn't have coincidences. There are God incidences. This is planned. And God's plan is perfect. And so Joseph and Mary went from where they were to Bethlehem because of taxes. Do you know that God uses the taxes to get Mary and Joseph to where Jesus was prophesied to be born? 
But Bethlehem wasn't this metropolis. It wasn't this outstanding city. In Micah chapter 5, verse 2, it talks about Bethlehem being one of thousands in Judah. Not an exceptional, not, not an, uh, an amazing over-the-top city, just an ordinary city that God was going to choose to do an extraordinary thing because there were people that were willing to reach back to God who was reaching out to connect with them to do something extraordinary. Then in verse 7, it says, And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room where? At the end, right? No room at the end. So everybody was back for the taxes. Everybody is upset because they've been disrupted. Their plans have been interrupted. It's all about taxes. They're not happy. And Mary and Joseph get there, and there's no place for them to stay, so they go out to the barn, basically what it is. And, you know, they probably weren't the first people because the inn was full. There probably were other people that came, and they said, we don't have any room, but the, you, can, you can go back and use the barn. But nobody did. But Mary and Joseph did in a very ordinary, common place that other people probably pass by. And there was no fanfare. There was no paparazzi because they didn't recognize. What if Mary and Joseph came to the, the door of the inn and talked to the innkeeper and said, do you have a room? We need a room. Well, no, no, we don't have any room. Well, you don't understand. My wife is pregnant. We don't have a room. I told you we don't have a room. No, no. My wife is pregnant with the Son of God. Oh, yeah, I'm sure we could find a room for you. That wasn't how it worked. No, sure wasn't. Because God wasn't going to make this big fanfare. But he was going to do something extraordinary in a very ordinary couple, in an ordinary situation that nobody else could ever imagine happening. Just like you and me. Many times we can't imagine God doing these extraordinary things through our lives, but God wants to. God's been reaching out to all of us to do extraordinary things through our ordinary lives. And we have to choose to reach back and be available because when this happened, we know the next part. We know that there were angels that appeared to the shepherds. And in verse 8 through 12, it says this. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for I, behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Good tidings of great joy. So all of a sudden an angel appears. Do you know that there are angels all around? We just don't see them. They're ministers to the heirs of salvation. Who's that? You. All of us. But this one comes into visible form. And he begins to tell them about what's happened that nobody else seems to be aware of, except all the spiritual world is aware that the Son of God has just been born in Bethlehem in a manger. And things have radically changed. And he said, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Good tidings, good news. Good news. God's news is always good news. The news we watch on TV, hardly ever good news. That's why we need to be listening to God a whole lot more than we need to be listening to man. But good news. But that word also, and I'm going to try and say it the best I can, uh, it's, I'm going to say it phonetically, but the word is euangelizo. Euangelizo. 
Now, I, I said that and embarrassed myself because I needed to make a point. And that is that this word is very common to us, but we don't recognize it. This was a moment in time where the angel is saying, I bring you good news, the gospel. Evangelize. It's the word evangelize that we use for evangelize. This is a moment in time to evangelize. The beginning of this happening in such a great way at the birth of Jesus. And great joy. Great joy. God's reaching out to connect the, with the good news of Christ being born. And it's great joy. As Christians, we should be filled with joy because the joy of God is our strength. And that isn't just Christmas time. You know, we, we sing joy to the world. We sing all these songs, but that is for every day, even though it points to Christ being born. Christ's birth should impact our lives every day. And it does. It does, to a greater or lesser degree. And it goes on to say, and we'll be to who? What's it say? We'll be to all people. Who? So in this moment, God wasn't reaching out just to Mary, to Joseph, to the shepherds. He's reaching out to all people. Because when God reaches out, to connect with us. When the extraordinary God reaches out to an ordinary person, we as ordinary people need to reach back to the extraordinary God so that God can do the extraordinary thing through our lives and again reach, stretch beyond us, stretch beyond our comfort zone, stretch beyond what is familiar. Just like Jesus made a stretch, he stretched beyond heaven and came to make his home in our neighborhood. We need to make our home. We need to go to people. We need to evangelize because that's really what Christmas is about. It's about connection. God reaching out to connect with people and people reaching back to connect with God and then God sending people to connect with other people to connect them with him. Because if not, it's an event. And Christmas isn't an event. It is something that is to empower our lives, our seemingly ordinary lives, to become extraordinary in our connection with God and in our connection with others. God doesn't have us just to have an ordinary connection with somebody. When you connect with somebody, whether it's in a line at the grocery store whether it's with family, whether it's with coworkers, whether it's with people that are being ugly to you. What God intends is that all of God's love, all of God's character would just overflow us. Because where we go, wherever we go, God's with us. God's living in us. It just takes us reaching to him. Instead of reaching towards and letting our anger control us, we reach toward God and let love control us. And all of a sudden, that person that deserves a nasty word because that's what they gave, what you sow is what you reap, they don't get what they expect. And there's been an impact on their life. Because We've received God reaching out to us. We've reached out to God, to the Holy Spirit in us, and allowed the fruit of the Spirit to come up in us and then be impacting to the person that God is trying to reach. Because we are impacting. We're impacting everybody around us. We're either helping people to come towards God or we're moving them away from God. And God only has for us to move them towards him but when we don't connect with him and don't rely on him and don't allow him to have his way, let the extraordinary God do extraordinary things through ordinary people, then 
we're not bringing people towards the Lord. And Christmas is about connection, about God connecting with people and people being able to connect with God. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, and this will be the sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. So, God's reaching out to these shepherds, these, these lower than ordinary people. And what are they going to do with this? When God reaches out to you and me, which he al always is, to connect, to bring his super into our natural world. The extraordinary God coming in contact with ordinary people, causing extraordinary things to be done. We have to choose to reach back. We have to choose to respond. What are they going to do with this information? Well, we know. We, we've read these things. We know. And it goes on to say, go ahead, John. And there was a, suddenly there was an angel, angel with the angel, a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. So there's more. On earth peace, goodwill towards men. And we hear that, we hear that. And when we think about peace, what does peace mean? What, what comes to mind when you, you think about peace? Tranquility, what else? Comfort. You know, it's, it's like that smooth, right? No, no problems, no troubles. It's just good. That's not what this word means. See, that's why it's important that we understand what the Bible is really saying. What's God saying to us? We have to study. And so when you dig down and find out this word, this word means to set it one again. Glory to God in the highest. And they're saying, glory to God, you're setting it one again. What? God and man. And then, goodwill towards all men. Men and men. People and people. Until we're set at one, until we're connected with God. God's reached out to connect to us. Until we reach back, we can't, we can't be connected. But once we are, then, and only then, are we going to be able to reach out to other people and positively impact their lives for eternity. Because without God, we are not going to love the way God loves. We're not going to be able to care and want the best for other people and be patient and kind and gentle full of joy, full of peace. But peace on earth setting. Glory to God, you're setting at one again, people with you. And the next restoration, the next connection, after we connect with God, we need to connect with people. Because when God influences our life and affects our life and puts his super on our natural, we can have a supernatural impact on the people around us. And help draw them to connect with him. Because they don't need the connection with us as much as they need the connection with him. And so, so they go. And we see this in, in verse 15. We're going to look at, at just three more verses. 15, 17, and 20. And it says, And the angel choir withdrew into heaven. The shepherds talked it over. Let's get over to Bethlehem as fast as we can and see for ourselves what God has revealed. So what do they do? They're reaching out to God. They're connecting. They're, they're going to see the Son of God, the Son of Man. You know, we've got a track with God. We've got to follow God. Without following God, we're going to get off track. We're going to get into darkness. We're going to get into danger, and we're going to experience the destruction that the enemy wants to bring to our lives every day. But they go, and, and they see the child. It's just like what they heard. Verse 17, seeing was believing, they told everyone that they met what the, what the angels had said about this child. So they went, they connected with God, God connected with them, gave this information, they acted on the information, they, they yielded and followed what God was saying, and all of a sudden, it 
totally changed their lives. These common people began to tell everybody. Tell everybody about the child. Tell everybody about Jesus. You know, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to tell everybody. How many of you have eaten at a really good restaurant recently? Awesome. When you eat at a great place, and it's really, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. What, what do you want to do besides go back? You want to you tell everybody else so that they can try it? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Because it was so good. It was the best. You want other people to enjoy the best that you enjoyed. Well, it doesn't happen with just restaurants. Why do we do that? Because it was the best to us, and we want the best for everybody else. And you know what? Jesus is the best for us. And we should want the best for everybody else. If we're willing to put our reputation on the line, put us on the line to tell somebody about a restaurant they may go to and find it not good, they didn't like it. It wasn't what you said. And they write off everything you're going to tell them after that. Because they could, couldn't they? They could reject your information for them. But I'm telling you right now, when we tell people about Jesus, that he's the best, if they will allow Jesus to connect with them and they'll connect with him, their lives will be transformed for eternity, forever. The best. Wow. How do you know that? Because the Bible says every good and perfect, the best and perfect gifts come from God. Now, what it doesn't say is everything will be easy peasy. Because we live in a broken, fallen world. But no matter how difficult it gets, he'll never leave you. He'll always be reaching out to bring you through, and we have to reach back. And then don't go alone. Invite other people. Grab the hand of somebody else. Because that's what God has for all of us to do. And we're seven days away from Christmas, but we're six days away from Christmas Eve service. And I will tell you that, that God is going to do great things in this Christmas Eve service. The children's ministry has a part, and it's always exceptional. And the youth have a part, and they do an exceptional job. And praise and worship is exceptional, all because ordinary people allowed an exceptional God to have his way in their lives And God does extraordinary things. And so who wouldn't want their loved ones, their friends, to be exposed to that? But there's a catch. Here's the catch. If everybody here brought a couple of people and all the people in the first service brought a couple of people and all those people that are online decided to come on on Friday to bring a couple of people. Saturday, sorry, Saturday. Uh, I'll be here alone Friday. (laughs) But brought friends and family Saturday to the Christmas Eve service. Guess what would happen? These chairs would be filled. And most likely, there would be standing room only. So my question to you is, would you be willing to get out of your comfort zone and invite somebody sacrifice, and make sure that there is room for people to sit while you stood so that they could be touched by God in an eternal, transformational way. You know, I I can't answer that question for you. You answer it for you. We each answer it for ourselves. But that's one of the opportunities we have. But it's not just Christmas Eve service. And it's not just Sunday service because wherever you go, God is there and God is wanting to reach out to people. Touch their lives so that they can reach back and see their lives transformed for eternity. 
And so this connection that is what Christmas is all about is a connection that is to be connected every day. Us with God. With our relationship connected to God, we reach out to other people. Amen? Like every head bowed, every eye closed. You know, we've talked about connection. But going to church doesn't necessarily mean we're connected to God. Just like going to McDonald's doesn't mean we're a hamburger. And that's cute, but it's true. We're not saved because we're born in America. Because America isn't acting like a Christian nation anymore. We're not saved because we read our Bible. We're not saved because we pray. Those are all good things, and they're all necessary for our lives. We need, we need prayer. We need to read the Bible. We need to go to church. It's all part of what God has. But the first thing, Jesus said he was the door. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Is that we recognize that Jesus was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on the cross to pay the price for our sins because every one of us has sinned, and was raised glorious and victorious and seated at the right hand of the Father, conquering hell and death in the grave, and is offering eternal life to anyone who would believe in him. If you have never believed in Jesus, if you have never entrusted your life to Jesus, this morning I'm going to give you an invitation and an opportunity to pray with us, whether you're here in, 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 in this building or you're online. But we're going to pray together and invite Christ to be Lord of our lives. So let's pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your son Jesus who came into this world, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for my sins, and was raised glorious and victorious. Today, Lord Jesus, I come to you and confess I have sinned. I ask you to forgive me, come into my life, be Lord of my life. From this day forward, I am yours. You are mine. Guide me, govern me, guard me. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, you know, let somebody know. Let me know. Let Pastor Gabe know. Let an usher know. Let somebody know. And you may say, I don't know nobody. Well, I will tell you this. If you turn to somebody here today and tell them you just received Christ as your Lord, they're going to celebrate you because now you're part of our family. Amen. And if you prayed online, uh, go to our website, reslifeny.org. Go down to where the prayer requests are. Let us know that you prayed. If you want us to be able to pray for you by name, let us know your name. And if you want us to contact you, give us some contact information. God is so good, isn't he? Would you stand? You know, before we go, it's important that you, you've been listening to a lot of things. And not everything that was said this morning was for you. But I can guarantee you one thing. There was something that was said here that God had specific for you. So before we dismiss and I pray over you, I'm just going to do what the Bible tells us in the Psalms to do. It's Selah. It's pause and reflect. So if you just bow your heads, close your eyes. And Father, right now, we are depending on you. We are needing you to clarify, make clear what was for me, each one of us individually. There were things for us corporately, but individually there were things that you have for us to, to grab a hold of, to adjust our lives to, to be absolutely confident in. Now, Father, we thank you. Thank you that this 
doesn't have to happen just in this building. That you can reveal things to us everywhere we go. That's part of Holy Spirit's ministry in our lives. So we thank you for what you've revealed and what you'll continue to reveal to us. And Father, I pray right now for every one of your children here and those online, I thank you for your presence. Not only with them, but the presence of the person of Holy Spirit that lives in them, that empowers them to live this abundant life as overwhelmingly more than a conqueror, that imparts to them the fruit of the Spirit as he has his way and gifts of the Spirit to impact the people around us. And Father, we thank you for this week. We thank you for all those that are celebrating Christmas. Father, we pray that they would truly know the connection that is at the heart of Christmas. And Father, we pray that in all the things that are ahead between now and our celebration, that we would keep you, Lord, absolutely at the center of it all, honoring you and adoring you. And we thank you for this. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. Have a great week. We'll see you on Saturday.